someone to come to your rescue. I'll give you a starter for ten. It doesn't have to be deep and meaningful. We were on holiday last year. We were on holiday. Drive into Tenby. I hit a rock sticking out in the road. Tire exploded. We could not get the tire off. And a passerby came to our rescue, helped us change the tire, and told us where to get a new one. When has someone rescued you? Was that your example all used up now? Oh, you've nicked it. Oh, <laughs> Um, decided he was going to come and look for us and when he saw us he started running towards us now he was in his late 80s so he fell over and sort of crashed onto the pavement how does it feel when you have to sit there and say I am helpless I am useless in this situation I need a rescuer I need someone to come and rescue me and that's kind of what we're thinking about today did anybody else before i start did anybody else want to come and t tell us of when they needed rescuing okay so if you've got your bible oh i've done my usual oh it's on there i've just i've copied and pasted and printed it and forgot to put the reference but we're in luke chapter 10 verses 25 to 37 very well-known passage in my Bible. It's headed the parable of the Good Samaritan. So we're on our third parable. Is it me or is it incredibly warm in here this morning? I am. Literally, it's running off me this morning. It's not funny. Oh dear, oh dear. I need a fan there. Um, parable of the Good Samaritan. We're starting at verse 25. It says... On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Simple parable today. Simple passage. One that we know very well. Um, I said we're on week three of our series of parables and I'm really enjoying it so far. I mean, we're not looking at every single parable because some of them... How do you define them? Some of them are one line long. So we're, we're picking out some of the more significant ones. But we're taking them in the order, as much as we can, that Jesus told them. So we started off two weeks ago on the boat with the people gathered round on the shore. And in that boat, Jesus told two parables about farmers and seed. And we've moved on a little bit now, but this is still quite an early parable. One that Jesus told really quite early in his teaching ministry. And it's a very well-known parable. In some ways it's too well-known, isn't it? And because we all know it so well, we know what it says, uh, we know what it means. But does it mean what we think it says? 
Surely, surely it's more than a call to simply be a good person. Surely it's more than a call to help people. I mean, they are vitally important things to do. But the, the, the thing is, have we turned Christianity into just be a nice person and be nice to other people and you'll be okay? See, Jesus wasn't killed for being nice. And to complicate it even more, uh, for us in our culture today, uh, the meaning of the word has been adopted and changed. So Samaritans, when you think of Samaritans, you think of an organization that helps people. You know, the Samaritans, you can call them up any time of day or night, and they are there. They will talk to you, and they will listen. And so Samaritan, in our culture, in our understanding, is a positive word. It has positive connotations. We think Samaritans, good. The thing is, in the culture that Jesus was speaking into, it wasn't a positive word. Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Now, we haven't done this for a little while, but I'm going to give you... I'm going to give you a brief history lesson. If this isn't your thing, fingers in your ears, um, and I'll tell you when you can join us again. So a brief history lesson. We know from our studies of the Old Testament, right, that Israel was made up of the te uh, 12 tribes. 12 tribes, yeah, all named after Israel's sons. Remember, we listed them all, needed a lay down. Joseph, there isn't a tribe of Joseph, but his two sons, Ephraim and Nasser, will do that as we go further forward in the Old Testament. So 10 tribes were to the north, two were to the south. Big lot to the north, little bit to the south. And it was Judah and Benjamin that settled in the south. And Jerusalem and the temple were in the south. King David, when he was king, he ruled over a united Israel. But then it split into two. And the north and the south became separate kingdoms with different kings. With me so far. Okay. Fast forward a little bit to the exile, when the people were taken out of their homeland. We're going to look at this, as I say, in more detail in the future as we return to the Old Testament. But what happened was, the northern kingdom was taken into exile first by Assyria. And we don't really hear much about them again. They kind of disappear. They um, intermarry, they assimilate with the Assyrians, they become watered down but the southern tribes the southern kingdom stayed strong but then some years later the southern kingdom was taken into exile by Babylon by the Babylonians um, remember the psalm made famous by Boney M by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept as we remembered Zion, as we remembered Jerusalem, as we remembered our hometown. Now, as I've said, the northern and the southern tribes dealt with exile very differently. The northern tribes, we don't really hear a lot about them. They intermarried with the Assyrians, with non-Hebrews. But you see, they themselves were still descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who became named Israel. So they still saw themselves very much as children of God's promise. And they lived to the north in and around Samaria. And then you had the southern tribes. And they stayed pure. They didn't intermarry with the Babylonians. They stood firm. It's where we get the stories. Daniel in the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who refused to bow down to the um, golden image and things like that. They are mostly southern um, from Judah and from Benjamin, who got taken to Babylon. And they stayed pure. And uh, at every point, they knew that they were in exile, and they cried out to God to save them, until eventually King Cyrus allowed them to return from exile to their homelands, and they rebuilt Jerusalem, and they rebuilt the temple. Fascinating stuff. And then they, the pure Jewish people descended from Judah, well, they despised and they hated the northern tribes because they had intermarried, they'd given up their heritage, they'd, they'd done appalling things whilst they'd stayed pure. Okay, you kind of get the background now to the story. The level of hatred between the two groups cannot be overstated 
cannot be. I mean, nowadays, if you think of the fighting and the bombing and the hatred between the Israelis and the Palestinians, it's every bit comparable. Every bit comparable. Um, they wouldn't have just crossed the road to go past someone laying in the road. They would have been more likely to give the beating. So imagine that we're in the crowd, we're gathered around Jesus. When this expert in the law, some translations call him a lawyer. If your translation calls him a lawyer, don't misunderstand that for the modern meaning, as in working in a court of law to get people off of criminal charges. A lawyer was simply an expert in the law. So this lawyer, <clears throat> this expert in the law, he asks Jesus a question. But you know when some people, you can just tell, can't you? When some people ask you a question, you know they don't really want to know an answer. They don't even want a debate or a discussion. They want to catch you out. They're trying to trip you up. They're trying to ridicule you and what you believe. And that's what this lawyer is doing. He asks Jesus uh, a question that he already knew the answer to. He was trying to catch Jesus out. So he goes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit, an eternal, to inherit eternal life? This man's an expert in the law. He knows the answer. So Jesus turns the question back on him and says, well, what does the law say? And of course the man knows what the law says. So he tells Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, the man says, be perfect, live in perfect love and live out perfect love. Jesus says, yes, exactly right, gold star, well done. And if you can do that, you will be saved. The problem is no one can do that, can they? No one can live a perfect life. Only one person ever in the entire history of the world has lived a perfect life. And that was Jesus. And the expert in the law, well, he's feeling pretty stupid by now. He realises that Jesus has tied him up in knots. Do you know who here plays chess? Anyone play chess? Yes, yeah, Steve. Oh, and Aaron. Fabulous. Hope you're not playing behind that. I hope you're paying attention. Um, but you know when you're playing chess with someone, or you're playing a game that you're really good at, and um, you, you think you're doing well, you're on top, you're moving your pieces, you're thinking, I've got this. And then the next time you look, no matter where you turn, they've got you. There is nothing you can do. And you think, how on earth did that just happen? It's like you're in checkmate. There's nothing you can do. Well, the expert of the law was in checkmate. Jesus had used his own knowledge of the law to tie him up in knots. But the expert in the law isn't giving up without a fight. So he says to Jesus, well then, who even is my neighbor? Isn't that such a hard question? Who then is my neighbor? And to be fair, for this man, for this lawyer, uh, God was the God of Israel. And so his neighbor was his Jewish neighbor. But rather than give a straight answer, Jesus tells a story. And it's a story that I want to respectfully suggest that we have got a bit back to front. So let's have a look at the story. We've got this man traveling on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. I've never been. Some of you have been. Apparently it's really hilly. Coming down, Jerusalem's high up, Jericho's low down, and it's a windy, twisty, dangerous road with lots of opportunities for robbers to be hiding, people for bandits to jump out, for you to get mugged or robbed uh, or murdered. So it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult road, but this man is travelling on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho when he's set upon by robbers who beat him. They took everything he had, including his clothes. Did you notice that bit? And all of his money, and they left him half dead. Maybe they thought he was dead. Who knows? But there was the man in the road with no way of helping himself. And so he lays there, utterly helpless. Along comes a priest who sees the man laying in the road and passes by on the other side. Now again, to be fair, got to give everybody a fair trial here. Priests would have travelled that road fairly often. They would have been either heading up to Jerusalem to carry out their priestly duties in the temple, or they'd be on their way back home, having carried out all of their priestly duties. Now if the priest was travelling towards Jerusalem, 
Then uppermost in his mind would have been to keep himself ritually pure so that he would be able to go and do all of his temple duties. You see, the law said that if he contracted impurity, for instance, by touching a dead body, because he doesn't know that this, this guy is alive or dead, and if he'd have touched a dead body, a dead person, he would have had to go through a long and a tedious process of ritual cleansing. So maybe that's the reason that he didn't help. Or maybe there's another reason. The wounded man has had his clothes stolen and he's laying unconscious on the ground, half dead. So no one could tell, either by his speech or by his clothes, what type of man he was and where he was from. Did you know that there was a traditional Jewish teaching uh, dating from a couple of hundred years before Jesus lived that said you should know the person that you are helping just in case you be found to be helping sinners. Ah. And so a priest might have been reluctant to help a stranger on the road who might have turned out to be a sinner or even worse, a Gentile, a non-Jew. And the expert in the law would have known about this teaching and so would the people listening. They wouldn't have been shocked or upset, as we are, that the priest passed by on the side of the road. But the man is still laying there, helpless. Next along comes a Levite. Now, a Levite is a member of the priestly tribe of Levi. All priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. You get that? To be a priest, you had to be a Levite, but not all Levites were priests. But, but they were part of the priestly tribes, and they would have assisted with the lesser priestly duties up at the temple, um, but they wouldn't have done the, the, the big stuff. Um, and the Levite, you know the story, possibly taking his cues from the priest up ahead, also crosses over and passes by on the other side of the road. Now, if I was to stand here this morning and say, I'm going to tell you a story, um, an English man and an Irish man walk by, who would you expect to walk by next? A Scotsman, exactly. Um, well, Jesus is using the... Uh, what? Oh, well, but <laughs> an Englishman, a Welshman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman. <laughs> but Jesus is using this same sort of, of thing. It's a well-known, um, a well-known saying: a priest, a Levite, and who would the people have expected to walk past next? An ordinary Jew. A priest, a Levite, and a Jew. Do you see? It, coming down the same order. That was a traditional story that was told. But the thing is, uh, the Jew would have come by, one of them, he would be the hero of the story, victory for the ordinary man. Except it's not a Jew that Jesus introduces next. It's a Samaritan, their sworn enemy. And it's the Samaritan that doesn't care about whether the helpless man is a Jew or a Gentile or if he's a saint or a sinner. It's the Samaritan that risks his own safety by taking the injured man to a hostel. He bandages his wounds and out of his own money he pays in advance for the injured man's care, promising to drop in and check on his way back that the man is being looked after. I struggle this morning to pass on to you the level of shock there would have been when the people who were gathered around heard this twist in the story. I mean, I don't know who for us, you know, who for us is the most despised person that you would be almost ashamed to receive help from. I mean, I wonder if, if the unconscious man would have rather have been left to die where he was than to be helped by a Samaritan. And Jesus turns the question back on itself when he says to the lawyer, which of these three proved themselves a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And even then, if you read your Bibles, even then, the, the, the lawyer can't say the word Samaritan. He can't bring himself to form the word in his mouth, and that speaks volumes. He says, oh, the one who helped him. And Jesus says, you go and do the same. 
Not what the priest did, not what the Levite did, not what God's chosen people did, but what your sworn enemy did. And that wouldn't have won Jesus many friends in that room today. In fact, it would have won him quite a few enemies. It's like if we were to tell the story today in today's language. I don't know who could have walked down the road. Um, a vicar, a Baptist minister and an imam walked down the road, do as the imam did. Um, a man, a woman and a transgender person walked along the road, do as the transgender person did. An English royal, a peer of the realm and an illegal immigrant walked along the road. Do as the illegal immigrant did. It's hard to convey. Do you see? Do you understand what I'm trying to do? It's hard to convey the level of shock, the audible gasps that would have gone around as Jesus said, do what the Samaritan did. And you see, by making the hero of the story a Samaritan rather than a Jew, Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is bigger is bigger than this small group of people. Salvation will come through the Jews, but it isn't just for the Jews. Grace is bigger than nationalism and populism. Your neighbor isn't just someone who looks like you, who believes what you believe, who votes like you vote. Your neighbor is someone, is anyone who needs your help. And we have a responsibility to love our neighbour today. That hasn't changed. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And love your neighbour as yourself. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. I've got a picture for us to look at. Um, there was a meme. It's just a, a, it's a word for a photo picture. Uh, on social media a while ago. It was absolutely brilliant. Here it is. Uncomfortable reading, isn't it? Love thy neighbour. Love thy homeless neighbour. Thy Muslim neighbour, thy black neighbour, thy gay neighbour, thy white neighbour, thy Jewish neighbour, thy Christian neighbour, thy atheist neighbour, thy racist neighbour, thy addicted neighbour. Who else could you add on to that list? Who is it so hard to love today? Who is the person that if we needed rescuing would be the last person in the world we would want help from? uncomfortable reading. I find some of those neighbours easier to love than others. When that came up on Facebook, it, it challenged me to my bones. It challenged me to my bones. Why should we love them? Why should we love them? I've got two reasons for you. I'm finishing off. I've got two reasons why you should love them. One, because Jesus said so. And we're told not just to read the word, but do what it says. Love your neighbour your sworn enemy, the one that doesn't look like you, sound like you, vote like you, dress like you, love like you, eat like you, love them anyway. And why else should we love them? Because we were in the gutter. We were that person, helpless, on the floor, half dead. Every single one of us. Every single one. We ourselves were half dead, we were helpless. We had no way of saving ourselves. And then Jesus came and he rescued us, he picked us up. And for some of us that was massive. Some of us, myself included, have huge testimonies of how Jesus transformed our lives, how we were heading for destruction, and Jesus came and he rescued us from death. And he bandaged us up, he healed us, and he saved us. Not one of us this morning is here because of our own merit. Not one of us is saved because we deserve to be saved. Not one. None of us can stand before the throne of God because we deserve to be there. Lord, if you marked our transgressions, who could stand? Well, not me. That's for certain. Jesus met me on the road when I was helpless, when I was headed for death, when I was beaten, when I was defeated. And he picked me up and he loved me and he healed me and he sent me out to do the same for others. That's why I tell people about Jesus. That's why that song is my anthem. We must go where Jesus sends us. God forgive me when I walk past on the other side of the road. Because I do. Because I haven't got time or I'm not feeling up to it, or I can't be bothered. 
this morning, who is your neighbour? Who is your neighbour? Not an out there question in the ether. A real, down to earth, think about it now kind of question. Get a face in your head. Who is your neighbour? Who needs practical help, but who needs to know how much God loves them? This is huge stuff, church. This isn't just being about nice. It's not just being nice people. The Jews were not allowed to keep God to themselves, and we are not allowed to keep God to ourselves. God is not just the God of Southwell Baptist Church. He's not even just the God of the Baptist Union of Great Britain, even though Baptists are obviously his favourite. God is not even, hold on to your seats, this is where you start throwing things at me, God is not even just the God of the Christians. God is the God of the whole world. Do you know he loved me and he called me before I even knew who he was? God is the God of the whole world. And his grace is big enough even for me. And his grace is big enough for the greatest sinner. Which one was a neighbour to the man who had fallen into the hands of robbers? Go then and do likewise. I'm going to sing a song again now. It's a real favourite of mine and I hope at least some of you know it. I saw the line in Hilly's email to um, Aaron that said the church might not know it and I went wobbly. Because <laughs> you really don't want a song that the church don't know is your last song. But it's a song that speaks of what God has done for us. It says, when I was lost, you came and rescued me. Reached down into the pit and lifted me. Oh, Lord, such love. Do you know it? Yes. Hallelujah. I was as far from you as I could be. Do you know why I've chosen this, though? Because it's a song that recognizes that we were lost and we were dead and we were in a pit. We were defeated. But Jesus came and he rescued us and he lifted us out and he set us on solid ground. And it's a reminder of who we were. It's a reminder of what Jesus has done to spur us to do the same for others. And again, I said a few weeks ago that I'm going to be offering prayer with anointing at the end of every single service because we can't do this stuff on our own. We need God's Holy Spirit. We need to know that we ourselves have been rescued and that we are saved. And this is for all of us. Every single one, from the youngest to the oldest. So again today, come, be filled with the Holy Spirit, be anointed for the work he has for you, and then in the power and the strength of Jesus, go and love your neighbour.